In the year 2007, the Cartoon Network conducted a crossover event where five of their most prolific animated series were interconnected by an alien invasion. These shows include Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, Ed, Ed, and Eddie, My Gym Partners and Monkey, Camp Laszlo, and The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. In the year 2020, six black animation fans got together and used their platform in order to pay tribute to said event. Now, we would have we would have called some of our white friends to join us, but like we kind of did this on a whim. The first of these six content creators is a man, a simple man, a man with the table that's round. Submitted for your approval. Cartoon Network invaded. Turn that fucking light back on. I, I really need to move out. Unidentified shadowy figures are recorded inside the Cartoon Network complex. The outline of their cranial structures does not seem to be human in shape. So I'm gonna let everyone in on a little secret. You know how for years you'll have people on the internet claim, oh my god, television used to be so much better when I was a kid in particular. And how out of most of these networks to face the wrath, Cartoon Network has definitely been one of the top channels to face this scrutiny. Well, there's a reason for that, and it's beyond nostalgia or newer cartoons not looking as appealing as the ones we had growing up or whatever the case may be. Cartoon Network becoming heavily criticized on the internet for no longer being the underdog, no longer being the greatest place for cartoons. But this factor that really changed the way people looked at Cartoon Network was absolutely 100% its branding, and how over the years it would be watered down more and more until it became something, uh, simplistic. While promotional material featuring cartoon characters interacting with one another was nothing new, there's no denying that Cartoon Network always went the extra mile. This was felt with Cartoon Cartoon Fridays, and later on, just Fridays, but more so than ever. This was felt with the advent of CN City. I know we like to throw around the word iconic nowadays on the internet, but truly, CN City was iconic. Utilizing so many techniques to have the characters of Cartoon Network all live under the same roof, or, well, uh, city. And it wasn't even just the bumpers, the website was in on it too. I remember logging on to CartoonNetwork.com, and if it was in the day, the images of CN City on the website would be that of daytime. When it was evening, around 5 to 8 p.m., it would be a sunset. And if you went on any time past that, it would be nighttime. This little touch did so much for immersing the average viewer of Cartoon Network because it really played into the idea that this was a real city, that these characters really are alive. But unfortunately, the branding was undone by the root of all evil. Aku money! It was expensive keeping Animal Logic around and having them crank out all these bumpers. And I'm sure bringing in all these voice actors from different shows, having them record lines just for the bumpers. <laughs> So I understand the position Cartoon Network was in, why they would have to downgrade. I don't think anyone is denying that. This was Cartoon Network branding at its fullest. But of course it's going to leave a bad taste in people's mouths when, in the following year, the only shows they're really promoting are Chowder and Flapjack, the previous running animated series are pretty much over, and CN City was no longer going, now we have the nudes! Which, I get the gimmick, but... Come on, a lot of these were the same poses, the characters, they still technically interacted, but it didn't feel like them, they weren't voiced by any stretch of the imagination, we had like the same two or three tracks, yeah, they still went in for the holiday season, but the magic was gone, and as a viewer, if you see not only all of these beloved shows gone, but the packaging you know and love gone, and with seeing real on the horizon, of course you're going to lose faith in Cartoon Network, of course you're going to think it's not as good as it was. That transitional period from CN City into CN Real and then after CN Real into the Adventure Time regular show era, it was fucking rough. And for a lot of people, I'm sure they would have appreciated closure on CN City. I don't know how you pull that off. I don't know how you can just close out an era of Cartoon Network and branding, but it probably would have meant a lot to the viewers. Luckily, Cartoon Network gave us just that 
Pina, a multi-show crossover on a scale never before seen. One that, in hindsight, did close out these era of cartoons, even if they didn't really wrap up with these episodes. Cartoon Network's last hurrah in this total immersion, where we're following into characters in a world that feels alive. This event was known as Cartoon Network Invaded, and over the next few days, you will get to experience Cartoon Network Invaded through a different lens. As I was able to team up with some awesome creators from the black cartoon community, and revisit something that I hold near and dear to my childhood heart. Seriously, I think this was the most exciting time to consume Cartoon Network for me. So without further ado, this video will cover the immersion. All the promos and bumpers and other marketing tactics that gave Cartoon Network Invaded its edge. Something that the other competing networks were never able to live up to. Don't go too far, because My Gym Partner's a Monkey will be right back on Cartoon Network Invaded. So, the actual story behind Invaded is pretty wild doesn't have much to do with this topic, this component of this Mega Invaded review, but I think it's worth mentioning. For the longest time, I was under the impression that this special was done in celebration of the moon landing's 50th anniversary. But apparently, according to Maxwell Adams, creator of the Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, Invaded was originally going to be a craft sponsorship that fell through at the last minute, which is why every episode of the event features Cheese in some way, shape, or form. Not Cheese the Fodgers character, he's just contained to the actual Fodgers episode and then the original Invaded ending, which we'll touch on, but actual Cheese that you like eat. It is an important plot point. Now, Cartoon Network Invaded was properly announced inside the network's 2007 upfront, but you see on air, there is genuine buildup and anticipation. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This was 2007, over 13 years ago. And unfortunately, not every piece of invaded content has been preserved on the internet. So although I've been rattling my brain, I for the life of me cannot tell you the initial very first teaser for this event. But I will say in either March or April of 2007, again, it was a slow burn, they really built up to this, Cartoon Network began airing very cryptic promos insinuating that aliens were messing with their shit. Giving the viewer this uneasy feeling, you're watching your cartoons, but what exactly is going to happen to those cartoons? What is happening to the network? Now, because Cartoon Network has always maintained a level of self-awareness, just like the shows, the network itself knew to not take itself too seriously. So, after being cryptic for a little bit, the network decided to give us just a little taste of our guest. Although the threat of an alien invasion is real, it appears to be not quite so menacing as originally thought. Take a look at the latest surveillance footage. Let's get back out there and do some righteous invading. What's the problem? <laughs> Door jam. Again? Let me try. I can do it. Move over, Major Muscle! I can do it! We really should commend the network's ability to crack jokes while still creeping the audience the fuck out. And with this promo, I also gotta give my shouts to the narrator of this entire event. His narration is consistent within all the promos, all the recaps, you name it. This was the voice of Cartoon Network Invaded. And having this man announce and narrate everything as if he was a radio host from back in the day was genius. It wasn't even something I necessarily understood or appreciated as a kid, but it did its job in conveying that this was something different. And by blacking out the aliens, it created this intrigue. What do they look like? Where do they come from? What is their mission? And why is nine-year-old Kevin terrified? Because the way they're animated, reducing these designs to a silhouette is very unsettling. No exaggeration, I'm pretty sure I had a nightmare over it. And as we got closer to this invasion, Cartoon Network gave us a pretty up close and personal look at the invaders. Finally, after all this build up and mystery, we get to see exactly who they are. Can't be as horrifying as whatever's conjured up in my head. Starting ah! Jesus Christ, what the fuck? Oh, that's weird. Why is it green? What the word? Is that stewy? For reference, it's not like we really had trailer track or anything to figure out when these promos would drop. 
So although I was just dying to know the scoop, my moment of satisfaction was more so a moment of surprise. I was completely thrown off guard on the commercial break. But with this promo, we got a proper idea of who was involved in Invaded. And let me tell you, getting the rundown was one of the most stressful moments of my life. At that point in time, I loved Ed and Eddie, so of course I wanted them there. But I also wanted to figure out which shows were going to make the cut. Who was worth being exploited for viewership? Starting with Monsters Home, imaginary friends. Yes! Uh-huh. Eh. Yo! Now you would imagine the network using their inconsequential, anything goes, episodic animated series for this event is just a no-brainer, and it really should have come as a surprise, but to me it did. In hindsight, yeah, these obviously were some of the biggest shows on Cartoon Network at the time. But when you're a kid, it made the concept of an invasion feel a lot more grounded. Because at this point, the schedule still had a pretty decent amount of variety, and I was still coming to terms with the concept of cancellation and syndication and reruns and all that. I really didn't know what to expect. Now, if memory serves, at least one of these aliens were voiced by Jason DeMarco. He's currently over at Adult Swim. He's the guy who runs Tanami, and honestly, it's just an unspoken hero of the entertainment industry. Regardless of what anyone says, we would not be where we are with anime being so prominent in the United States without Jason DeMarco. I feel as if a lot of music and voices would have gone unheard. The dude's a visionary, could not give him enough credit. Don't go anywhere. Foster's home for imaginary friends will be right back on Cartoon Network Invaded. So as the start of Invaded approaches, and in my tiny brain, all of these shows are about to cross over and change forever, Cartoon Network decided to up the ante and ensure that no one could escape Invaded. Of course, I was on the internet just as much as a kid as I am now, and boy, was I glued to CartoonNetwork.com, Nick.com, DisneyChannel.com, you name it. Imagine my surprise when I start up Cartoon Network the week of May 4th, 2007, and I'm greeted with this. A splash screen that features chilling, yet aesthetically pleasing silhouetted art of Mac and Blue holding each other as the illuminating font lingers above their heads. Unexplainable. Do mysterious beings lurk in our very homes? Referencing the plot of Cheese a Go Go, where Blue is led to believe that Cheese is an alien. And yeah, this carried on week from week. If you went on CartoonNetwork.com before it took you to the actual site, you would be dealt with one of these bad boys. Mysterious. What strange creatures are taking over the cul-de-sac? Shocking. Watch as Adam comes face to face with something that's not human. Frightening. Panic erupts. When bodies are snatched, is anybody safe? Horrifying. Witness the unspeakable. Billy and Mandy encounter the space invaders. And I love how these are almost identical to old school horror movie posters. They also had flash games every week, which apparently no one wanted to archive. Uh, okay. This coupled with the packaging of the general network really drove the point home that this channel for all intents and purposes was really invaded. Even the Friday night block got affected. There's this weird in-between block of Cartoon Network Fridays and uh, Friday Dynamite just called uh, Friday Night Premiere Thunder. It had a giant monster truck type vibe. It, it was... They tried, okay? But during Invaded, it transformed into Friday Night Premiere Laser. They weren't just gonna have the block share a night with Invaded. No, 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 no. Invaded would infect that block. But what about the actual packaging for the event itself? Well, during Invaded, the shows featured did not have their typical theme songs, but instead, a special opening sequence that features a UFO flying above a Cartoon Network city. Hmm and more or less broadcasting the credits as it flickers through clips from throughout the episode. And that theme, mmm, it slaps. I also really dug how they call these chapters. Not only did they put in the work to immerse their audience for the first time since CN City, but they really trusted the audience, which only added more to the immersion. They even referred to it as a miniseries. Tell me, what self-proclaimed miniseries did Nickelodeon and Disney Channel have? I'm sure someone's gonna bust one out and make me look like a fucking idiot, but I'm pretty sure Cartoon Network were the first ones to look at their young audience and say, yeah, you guys know what we're getting at. Let's not dance around anything. 
Now, the most impressive part to me wasn't the Invaded will be right back or next time on Invaded, but the fact that the packaging transcended the premiere. Typically, during events, even long going events, networks will only air it for its premiere and maybe an encore. But Invaded kept its packaging the entire time. When any of these episodes were reran during May, they had the Invaded packaging. I'll never forget, fourth grade. Had to transfer schools because I was dealing with some, uh, you know, RACISM. And the school I got transferred to actually had cable. So one day in after school latchkey, we decided to put on Cartoon Network and guess what comes on. One of the episodes from Cartoon Network Invaded. And to my surprise, it aired with the complete packaging. The Be Right Back, the Now Continues, it was all there. Alongside other generic bumpers that the network created for this event. Again, it kept this momentum and illusion going that the network was really in danger. These characters were really in trouble. And the atmosphere for Invaded really made up for the actual contents of the episode, considering they never really actually crossed over, except for the original ending <laughs> that I missed the first time around, <laughs> and then had to catch a rerun and the original ending never aired. I didn't see it again until years and years later online, let me tell ya. <laughs> it felt as if these shows weren't going to go back to normal until after the invasion was over. Now, it's not like they actually went that far. Every Foster's rerun or Ed and Eddie rerun or Jim Partner rerun having uh, the invaded intro attached, but still having those particular episodes rerun with that particular packaging. To this day, that still blows my mind. Networks don't really have to uh, go in with their branding anymore, especially Cartoon Network, who, no shade intended, more or less ensured that the packaging and bumpers on their channel aligns with their app leading to a whole lot less of, well, everything, but especially atmosphere. Things do feel like they're by the numbers, and I'm sure that does impact the way people engage with the actual content. No matter how you remember Cartoon Network Invaded, it cannot be denied that it was really the last big event this network put on. I always wanted another Invaded. I wanted to see some more serious shows involved, like fucking Ben 10, although the invasion would be over by the end of the 22 minutes. And I get it, a lot of the people involved didn't even really want to do it. Creatives hate being told what to do. Man, oh man, I just want more. And maybe after this video, you do too. Please check out everyone else's entries in this mega review. Everyone worked really hard on this, and I can't wait for you guys to see everything. And don't worry, this isn't one of those collabs with a story or anything cringe like that. Wait, what is that? Oh my god! Our first story is told by a very knowledgeable semi-aquatic egg-laying mammal of action. His videos will make you feel many things, but most important, they'll make you feel nostalgic. You know, like, don't just like skip his part just because it's like text-to-speech, you're gonna fuck up the sequencing. Letter for Mr. Nostalgia. Oh, hey. Thanks, James. No problem. Hey, you look a little different, bro. Did you get a new haircut? No. I'm wearing a new hoodie. That can't be it. Alright, Stalgia. I'll talk to you later. That was weird. Let's see what that letter says. Hello, Mr. Nostalgia. My name is Kel. I am the head of PR at the international brand Baby. Thank you for accepting our sponsorship offer. We're working on a new project called In Baby, a campaign that brings a collaboration between high profile reviewers for one big video. This package we are sending you includes your segment to review, which will be Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. Your review should be completed and showcase clips for the segment. We will also be sending a package to the five other collaborators your video will be put together with. Can't wait to see your product. Kel. High profile reviewer, huh? Well, that wouldn't be the term I'd use to describe me, but it's all good. Let's see what I can come up with. The 
episode begins with Frankie at the post office, talking to her grandmother on the phone. She's there to deliver a few packages, but what I found really cool about the scene is that, after doing some research, I discovered that the packages Frankie has in the scene actually go out to characters from other shows, and we see those same packages appear in the other episodes attached to this event. For example, the green one at the top goes out to Clam from Camp Laszlo, the purple one underneath is seen in Adam's locker from My Gym Partner's A Monkey, the big blue one appears in Billy and Mandy, and the purple one at the bottom goes out to Jimmy in the Eddie and Eddie episode. These were incredibly small details that I would have never noticed if it wasn't for the internet, but the fact that they did this knowing that 99% of the kids watching this would probably not realize the connection, brings a smile to my face. It's small things like this that make this event so special, and my people remember it after all these years. Anyway, while Frankie is at the post office, she notices that Cheese, the annoying imaginary friend that everyone dislikes, is there as well. He keeps repeating this phrase. Over and over again. After she throws her phone in anger from dealing with her mother the whole time, Frankie drives off to her next errand. That's when she sees Cheese, still saying gotta go, over and over again. Frankie, being the good Samaritan that she is, picks Cheese up and puts him in the Foster's bus after he almost gets ran over by ongoing traffic, Brad Pitt style. Frankie arrives at her next errand, which is a movie theater. She's there so she can pick up Mac and Blue, but Cheese escapes the bus and starts running around. Frankie asks a theater worker if he's seen Blue. He responds, and points to his direction. Frankie runs into the theater to find him, but kinda causes a scene in the process. She gets a phone call from Madame Foster and picks it up, which only makes the audience more upset. While talking to her, Cheese finds his way into the theater and begins going crazy. Frankie goes after him again and because of the fact that he's covered in butter flavoring, he slips right through her. After that, we cut to a scene where Blue, Mac, and Cheese are all with Frankie in the Foster's bus, which we can assume means that she caught him. They arrive at their next stop, which is the dentist's office to pick up Eduardo after getting a tooth removed. They're greeted by an angry Coco, who I assume is mad because Frankie was late. Ed who's currently high off of anesthesia, is talking to some random kid. That's when Cheese runs in and continues his shenanigans from the past few minutes. The whole gang starts running around the office trying to find and contain Cheese. Cheese climbs on top of a TV and starts hanging out there. The gang kind of use this time to take a break and figure out their next move. Blue picks up a magazine and begins reading it. After a few seconds, he sees an article about space aliens invading Earth, and guess who they look exactly like? Cheese. Blue uses his overactive imagination to come to the conclusion that Cheese is actually an alien. Why? Well, because he's blue. After successfully getting Cheese, the gang is back on the Foster's bus, and are on their way to their next errand. Blue tells Mac that he thinks Cheese is an alien. Of course, since Mac seems to be the only sane person on the bus besides Frankie, he doesn't believe Blue, and instead throws his magazine out the window. Meanwhile, Frankie is still on the phone with her grandmother, and screams at her saying that she's on the way. Up until this point, we never really find out where Madame Foster is calling from. As it turns out, she's actually in court, because Foster's resident Jackie Cones is suing her. Why? Because, she ate his sandwich. No, seriously. That's literally the reason why. The scene, although funny, doesn't really add much to the whole alien invasion plot, which is why I won't go too deep into it. But I just wanted to point something out real quick. If you look closely in the background, you'll actually find Fred Fredberger, from Billy and Mandy. This was an extremely minor detail that I only caught thanks to Wikipedia, but it's still extremely cool and is yet another easter egg that links all of the shows in the invaded event together. Anyway, the gang arrives at the courthouse to serve as witnesses for the so-called crime, but what they don't know is that they're actually too late. Frankie explicitly tells Blue to watch Cheese, and stay on the bus. But of course, Blue has his own plan. He grabs the bus radio and alerts the aliens that they can take Cheese, and return to their home planet. He realizes that the signal is too weak, and decides to find another way to get his message out to the aliens. Only problem, is that after he rips out the bus radio and gets ready to leave, he realizes that Cheese, and, a loopy Eduardo, have disappeared from the bus through the emergency exit. Mac, Jackie, 
Frankie, Wilt and Madame Foster are returning to the bus, only to find out that Eduardo, Cheese, and Blue, are all gone. On top of that, the bus is being towed away because Frankie parked in a no-parking zone. Things aren't looking too good for the gang, so Frankie, thinking quickly, comes up with a plan that involves her and Wilt finding Blue, Cheese, and Eduardo, while Mac and Madame Foster get the bus back. That plan doesn't really work out though, because Blue is actually the first one to find Cheese. Blue captures him, and after looking around, finds a good place to get his message out. Wilt finds Eduardo, which leaves Frankie to find Blue and Cheese. At that moment, Frankie hears a loud announcement from Blue about how the aliens should come get Cheese. That's when she figures out where Blue and Cheese are. The Observatory. Wait. Oh, so that's what an observatory is. She enters the observatory and finds that Blue has tied up two scientists, taken over the controls, made sure Cheese can't run off, and is broadcasting over the city with the bus radio. Angrily, she grabs Cheese, and the radio, and sets off to take Cheese home. Frankie drops off Cheese at his creator Louise's house. She's tired, beaten up, and appears to have some sort of large rat on the back of her jacket. After Cheese runs off into the house, Frankie asks Louise the only thing she wanted to know the entire episode. Where does Cheese have to go? To which she responds with, I don't know. Sometimes he just likes to go. But oh well, if you gotta go, then you gotta go. Cheese escapes the apartment, but Frankie is too tired to chase him again. Her phone rings, and she answers to find her grandmother has gotten into another predicament. Turns out, Everyone got arrested. I mean, even Wilt and Mac got arrested, and they didn't do anything wrong. Frankie promises to pick them up in the morning, and continues to walk down the stairs of Louise's apartment. Back at the observatory, a signal comes in from outer space that, when deciphered, is a repeated chant of cheese. It seems as if Blue's plan to contact the aliens actually did work in the end. Because now, the aliens are coming. And they want their cheese. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how the episode ends. Overall, I think this is a really solid episode. The pacing was pretty fast, but unlike some shows and movies, it actually works, considering the plot. In this episode, we really felt Frankie's pain. And, after rewatching this for the review, it really made me appreciate how great of a character Frankie is. Remember, Cheese wasn't a member of the house. So technically, Frankie didn't actually need to help him, or take responsibility in getting him to where he needs to go. She could have easily just left Cheese in the street, but she didn't. She knew before picking him up, full well what she was getting herself into. But she didn't care. And that's what makes her such a great character. The rest of the characters were cool in this episode too, I guess. Yeah, baby, you smell like pineapples. This is probably one of the most stressful episodes the show has ever had, besides stuff like Store Wars and Squeeze the Day. But again, those are the kind of plots that this show is good at handling, at least in my opinion. I'll give this episode an 8.5 out of 10, making it my favorite episode of the Invaded Event, and one of my favorite Foster's episodes ever. Now if you excuse me, I have some Zeke and Luther episodes to watch. Peace. Whoa, what the heck is that? Is anyone there? Hello? What's going on? Next on our roster, we have a man, a man whose core purpose is to share his thoughts, all a thousand of them. Yeah, and your YouTube's not busted. I don't, I don't think, I don't think he knows how to move his mouth. Hello, man. My name is Kel. I am the head of PR at the international brand Baited. Thank you for accepting our sponsorship offer. We're working on a new project called Invaded a campaign that brings a collaboration between high-profile reviewers for one big video. This package we are sending you includes your segment to review, which will be Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Your review should be comedic and showcase clips from the segment. We will also be sending a package to the five other collaborators your video will be put together with. Can't wait to see your product. Kel. Hmm, this seems on the level.
Well, now that my mysterious sponsor has sent me the special, I can finally tackle this one. Though I'm a, a little worried I haven't heard from Ostrog Vox and Mr. Nostalgia since they did their parts. I'm uh, hoping this isn't too much of a trend. But to continue on with things, let's look more into Cartoon Network's Invaded event. Now, one of the most prominent episodes I remember from this event was the Ed, Ed and Eddie episode. Now, something to keep in mind was that the creators of these shows didn't want to do these events at all, so you notice very jarring dips in quality among them. But the odd thing is, Ed, Ed and Eddie still held their quality. They didn't falter at all, which is kind of admirable pushing out a pretty funny product even against your best wishes. I mean, considering these Invader episodes took up a whole episode of the season order, it's just fascinating that they put genuine effort into this. It's even weirder with the fact that Danny Antonucci is notorious for being against the industry, but treated this like it was a normal episode. You gotta give props to the man though. He didn't have to, but he did anyway. I pay my respects. Fuck America. Now, this episode starts so different from other Ed and Eddie episodes with Jimmy of all people frolicking through a land of gumdrops and berries and cream. <gasps> berries and cream, berries and cream, all the little of berries and cream. I don't know why I showed you that either, but moving on. The dream sequence is pretty nuts, mainly for this one instance where the Eds are bent over some giant clown toy thing that keeps spanking them. Now, I've said this before, and I'll say it again, I don't kink shame. The dream goes by fine, but then it just turns into a total nightmare when a giant pizza cutter comes from the sky and starts slicing a big circle into the cul-de-sac and just taking it. It's done in a manner that's so menacing, especially with the use of color and these dark tones. Even having Jimmy fall from the sky as he watches Sarah get taken away. You just think, Jesus, it's just a dream, but like I said, they put the effort in. The rest of the episode is just really about some strange goings on with Ralph's house since his house keeps spewing this weird alien aura from it. Some come in contact with the house like Johnny who... <sighs> we get introduced to him digging out of a garbage can. Like, come on man, you had him dressed like a monkey, you had him put a watermelon on his head, and now this? Y'all just can't let a black man prosper, huh? But anywho, Johnny starts babbling about the strange stuff happening with Jimmy backing him up with his dream as evidence. As first, people are skeptical about the whole thing, but immediately change up when they see a meteor fly out of Rolf's house. Now you'd expect them to just have Double D be the complete skeptic of it all, but he gets on board pretty fast the second he sees Ed come out of this meteor, which... Okay. This episode manages to pace itself pretty well, so you follow along perfectly. No one overtakes anything, no gag runs too long. It's just very consistent in timing. Everything kind of goes the way you'd expect with Ed saying some weird things going on inside the house. Granted, it's pretty nonsensical, and for some reason he's in his underwear. I mean, that would raise some red flags to me too. Stranger danger is all I'm saying. The cul-de-sac gang mount an assault on Rolf's house and everything just goes wrong in the most hilarious ways possible. Everyone just proves that they'd be useless in an alien apocalypse. My favorite joke out of all of it was the gutterball one. Go back from whence you came, aliens from the unknown! <laughs> I hope you're going to pick those up. You guys are useless! Like, do you know how hard it is to get every ball to miss like that? The laws of physics and probability have to be so against you for that to happen. I used to bowl when I was a kid, so seeing this type of fail both hurts me, but at the same time, it has me holding my sides. If anything like that happened to be, I'd just give up on bowling for the rest of my life. I wouldn't even play with my friends ever again, I'm just done. It's also kind of a first for the series for all the kids, including the Eds, to band together for something. Usually they're enemies, you know, because the Eds keep trying to chip them out of their money. It's nice that they went this route just for this special. They didn't have to, yet they did. Very nice touch. The episode then ends with everyone finally getting the answers to what's going on with Rolf's home. Turns out his family was visiting from his homeland and they just have very weird customs like putting squids on their heads. You know, one of the weirder things is that this low-key had some xenophobic implications with the fact that Ed was completely freaked out by their ways. Keep in mind, this is the same dude that said shit like this. Butter toast! For no good reason and does shit like this. <laughs> 
and yet Rolf's family is too weird for him. Like, they implanted the fear of God into him, made him realize he was mortal type shit. I couldn't stop laughing this whole episode. From start to finish, this episode was just pure hilarity. But the episode doesn't just end there. For it turns out, Jimmy's dream wasn't just fantasy, for the aliens did take the cul-de-sac. This is fantastic for the series because now it means the gang has been chosen by our alien overlords to achieve an enlightenment and evolve past our trivial forms. Our new lords have finally begun their calling and will transcend us destructive humans to new levels of greatness. Yes, take us, O oh great and powerful ones. Lead us to a new beginning that will reunite us with our prehistoric brethren you took millions of years ago. I am ready. I am ready. <laughs> <laughs> Who's next? I uh, guess it's just me. I, I don't know. Hey, yo, what the hell are you doing? I'm supposed to be doing a video on Home on the Range right now, so. Yeah, whatever this is, I'm pretty sure it's better. Hello, Tariq. My name is Kel. I am the head of PR at the international brand Baited. Thank you for accepting our sponsorship offer. We're working on a new project called Invaded, a campaign that brings a collaboration between high-profile reviewers for one big video. This package we are sending you includes your segment to review, which will be My Gym Partner's A Monkey. Your review should be comedic and showcase clips from the segment. We will also be sending a package to the five other collaborators your video will be put together with. Can't wait to see your product, Kel. <laughs> Niggas gave me gym partner? Cartoon Network used to do a lot of cool shit, son. Back in May of 2007, Cartoon Network did this massive event where five of their running shows at the time were loosely tied together by alien invaders that all carried the exact same design. Except Foster's? Niggas kind of hard-headed. D-Dub Man of Review Your Life actually did a video going over all of these a few years ago, but he's from Texas and what's so great about dumb old Texas? <laughs> Five shows, Foster's Home, Ed, Ed and Nettie, Camp Lazlo, Billy and Mandy, but smack dab right in the middle, My Gym Partner's a bitch ass, My Gym Partner's a monkey. Wait, what's that other thing I said? I used to go to a human school where everyone was the same. You'd really be surprised which shows were produced in widescreen, I tell you. I'm happy that I happened to watch A Little Gym Partner before I sat down for this video. I genuinely forgot how much I enjoyed this show growing up. I ain't gonna lie, it's probably funnier than you remember. Alright, my nigga, it ain't that funny, calm down. The episode in question for the invaded crossover is called That Darn Platypus. After the aliens invade the Eds, the gym partnerhood gets hit with a power outage, but they still make the kids go to school for some reason. I, I don't know, man. If they could throw a nigga in an all animal school just because his last name's Lion, they can make you crack the books open during the blackout. Do, 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 do. There's a new student. A platypus named Rick, voiced by Gilbert Gottfried, doing the most Gilbert Gottfried, Gilbert Gottfried voice I've ever heard in my life. You know that man, respect that man. Is it me or just my pretty face? So everyone thinks he's an alien off rip, everyone except Adam, and it kind of frames itself as one of those don't judge a book by its cover stories. But like, the audience already knows they're right, so we're just waiting for Adam's goofy ass to figure it out. He just kind of thinks he's joking the whole time. <laughs> You might want to tone down the shtick, Rick. I was- what? What'd you say? You said Slick Rick? No. I ain't never really been too big a fan of these don't judge a book by its cover plots. At least not when the characters that pass judgments are like, actually right. It always kind of comes off as shallow or unnecessary to me. Like, I'm not expecting poetry from my gym partner's a fucking monkey or anything. But these kind of story turns always make me feel a little uncomfortable. After all, I mean, look at me. I'm way different than anyone else who does videos like this. I get judged all the time. You know what it feels like to be judged simply because of how you look? Of course I do. I'm part robot. Yeah, he gets it. The story does lead us to this joke though, which honestly cracks my shit up every time I hear it. It isn't fair to accuse someone of being a space alien just because they're odd. 
You know, I think Adam has a point. I mean, I have a crush on a human and tend to speak without thinking. Yes, Ingrid is right about herself. <laughs> I mean, yeah. The whole rest of the episode is Rick hamming up the whole alien thing and Adam telling him that the joke is getting old and for him to chill out. Some stuff goes on in the middle, but not really. Jake and the guys go to these Star Trek ass niggas for help to stop the alien. Shoom, 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 shoom. They do an anus joke. Except for the planet that must not be named. You mean Jupiter? No, I think he means your anus. <laughs> Principal Pixie Frog and his assistant try to see if Rick is in the database, which would prove that he is an alien. They don't find anything, so yeah, they think this nigga's an alien. Shorty wants to take a picture of the alien to get rich. Pixie Frog tries to hop in on that action, but like, she tells him to back off or else she'll leak his nudes. In the end, Adam gets fed the fuck up and tells Rick to stop bullshitting. And Rick says, <laughs> okay. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Do a little digging and you'll be quick to find out that this wasn't an idea that any of these showrunners had. All five of these are completely different cartoons. I'm not gonna say that they didn't want to do it, but <laughs> nah, my nigga, they didn't want to do this shit. You can't really feel it in the Fosters or the Ed, Ed and Eddie episode, but it kind of starts to trickle in here. I don't think this is a bad episode at all. It definitely uses what they had to great lengths. They do this joke, which would blow any 10 year old's mind in 2007 like it did mine. Where'd you read that? A respected scientific journal. I like that Adam is open with the new kid. It's a dynamic that works for him because he had to adjust to life at the animal school too. He's constantly telling people not to judge Rick like they judged him throughout the course of the series for being a human. That's something really interesting that works thematically. The episode's biggest crime is that there's no meat to it. There's a beginning with the power going out and there's an end with the revival of Rick as an alien, but Jesus Christ is that middle drag to help. Adam drives her. Adam drives the story for most of it, but there really is a lot of padding in this thing. Like why why does this gag go on for so long? I haven't rewatched the rest of the entire series yet, but I can tell that Jim Partner works at his best when he gets in, tells his story, its jokes, and gets out in that 11 minute format. I mean, you saw how fast I explained that episode plot. Imagine that going on for 30, 30 minutes. 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 It treads the same ground over and over and over again. Rick, relax. You're scaring everybody with this alien shit. You're not funny. I love comedy. You want some brain juice? So what the fuck did I just say? Brain juice, bro. We get it. I can't say I blame them wholeheartedly. I mean, Camp Laszlo ended up doing two 11 minute episodes for this. And I could see them not even wanting to think about the headache of doing something like that. But in comparison to what the other shows were doing before it, this is definitely on the hollow end. They resort to a lot of red herrings, a lot of screwy audience jokes that end up making it a pretty fun watch. Just wish there was a little bit more going on, I guess. Rick, you in here? Wait, I'm sorry, hold on. Where is Dub? Review your life. He's supposed to call my phone and do a bit about how we didn't call him for this collab. We set this up weeks ago. Finally. Amen. I After watching all of these episodes, I've been doing some thinking. No, not thinking on the lines of my crack theory about how Upgrade You by Beyonce and Every Girl in the World by Young Money have the exact same beat. Oh. Go on, go check. <laughs> you know you want to. About a week ago from me writing this, Cartoon Network dropped the trailer and the release date for the We Bear Bears movie. But they announced that it would come out on streaming instead of on TV like you'd expect. And it really started to settle in for me that this 
is our future now. We'll never get an event like seeing Invaded ever again. I hate to sound like an old head, but man, was shit like this cool. That goes for anything like this. The CN City promos, those stop motion Nickelodeon Christmas shorts, you know the ones. Hell, even that hurricane night with all the Seth MacFarlane shows. I mean, like, listen, this wasn't some random thing that they did. This was an event. CN Invaded is a personification of the creativity that networks had in the mid 2000s. Custom promos, references in each episode, changing the entire aesthetic of the network. It's not even like, it's not plausible to put this kind of effort in anymore. Don't nobody watch TV? Fam, there was a point in time where if a network show got 2 million views in ratings, it meant cancellation. My nigga, The Simpsons doesn't even get that anymore. It's, it's kind of a bummer. Creativity ain't dead, not in the slightest. There's mad benefits to streaming and the art of binging has led to like some really, really cool things done with storytelling in the past few years. But shit like this? <laughs> I'd be lying if I said that this didn't change my life for the better. <sighs> All right, there's your gym partner video. Time to go give Home on the Range 20 minutes worth of bars and end on an AMV with an unrelated hip hop song because apparently being black is my only character trait. Hey, what the f What's going on? This isn't no, this, this isn't one of those shitty collabs with a plot, is it? I fucking hate those. Tackling an ambitious two-parter, our next creator is relatively new to the game. But if I had to describe him, I'd have to say, cash rules everything around me. Cream, get the money. Dollar dollar bill, y'all. His name's, his name's Cash. Okay, let's see what we got. Hello, Cash. My name is Kel. I am the head of PR at the international brand Baited a campaign that brings a collaboration between high-profile reviewers for one big video. This package we are sending you includes your segment to review, which will be Camp Laszlo. Your review should be comedic and showcase clips from the segment. We will also be sending a package to the five other collaborators your video will be put together with. Can't wait to see your product. Kel. Okay, 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 wait. Sponsorship? This must be a goddamn mistake. I don't even have 300 yet. Oh well, anything to get out more content. Bruh. Oh hey, Lazlo. Dude, I loved Camp Lazlo as a kid. This is gonna be great. Me thinks not. Me thinks not. Well, uh, <laughs> hope you didn't have super high hopes, because, uh, oh boy. Disappointed! Okay, here's the scenario. I haven't seen any of these episodes for this event, or Lazo in god knows how long, but I remember really liking Lazo when I was younger. So I was really excited to see what was up. Yeah, we got a Samson episode first off. I can hardly contain my excitement. Strange Trout from Outer Space is the first part of this episode. And I was about to jump for joy when I saw JG Quintel's name in the credits, but this ain't close enough. I'm close to falling asleep. The fact that we're dealing with aliens isn't a bummer here, it's just that, again, this is a Samson episode. The aliens are weird, credit for originality. The three aliens we deal with all look the same, but have their own voice and personality. Okay, well, I'm not saying that all aliens look the same. You, you know what I mean. Okay, okay, so you are aliens with a weird fiddle fetish. Yo, yo, wait a minute, fiddle what now? Wait, hey, wait, wait, wait a minute, they're not gonna... No, uh, oh, oh, okay, so Samson's not getting probed. But at least through these interactions, we learned that these aliens aren't threatening. Like, at all. They want cheese. Samson gets to dumped on the camp kidney after he was abducted, and Lazo says that we have three new campers from Canada. And there are fish that look like the fish that one of the aliens shapeshifted into. I find that completely unrealistic. You expect me to believe that Canada is a real place? Yes, Canada. It was a frozen, hostile wasteland. I think the bit where Raj is effectively setting up Samson to tell tremendously terrible tall tales kind of sticks out. 
Just like the time you said you could dunk a basketball, or the time you said the third to last toilet in the latrine doubled as a time machine, but only you know how to use it. I mean, we already know Samson isn't well liked, but I feel like the episode really hammers that in, and it isn't subtle. Now, granted, I am not caught up with Lazlo lore or whatever the hell, but I doubt everything that Raj is talking about actually happened. <laughs> It's no wonder the freaking background character is the only ones to go along with his claims. And of course, Samson thinks his suspicions are true when he overhears them wanting to steal the cheese. The nobites and Samson get foiled pretty easily and the fish, who are later revealed to be professional Canadian cheese feeds. Yeah, Canada's not real, I'm just saying. They're not even a real country anyway. So yeah, they get away. All's well that ends well, but oops, turns out the nobodies were the aliens all along. Like, I vibe with this. It's, it's a good twist, and I vibe with the aliens being hilariously incompetent. And the ending does fit. I just, I just don't know. The whole episode didn't flow the best for me. Really, I'm struggling to say a lot for this episode. It's just mid overall. It's got some funny jokes, like earlier when the aliens clearly see that holding Samson hostage wouldn't exactly work when the campers that really give a shit about him. <laughs> but I remember the show being a lot funnier. Maybe if we had like another camper in the place of Samson? Like, think of it like this. Lazo, Raj, and Clam would probably end up trying to befriend the fish, but their shenanigans made them increasingly aggravated and almost blow their cover. It makes Samson look more suspicious, but since this is Samson, nobody gives a shit. It could end with the fish being so annoyed that they say the mission is a bust and go back without the cheese. Raj or someone else ask, hey, where's those background nobodies? And we see a shot of them getting the cheese. But, noticing that it's a small amount, they go back in their ship and go over to the girls' camp. I think that would have worked much better, especially since Samson still plays a part in the episode, but for everyone's sake, it's very small. He just isn't a character I want to spend time with. At all. It's like looking at me a decade ago. Good lord, I don't want to do that. But hey, at least this episode is a two-parter. Twin. Thankfully, the second half of the episode, Cheese Orbs, is much better. It picks up immediately after, and the same three aliens end up swooping in on the day of Acorn Flats International Cheese Festival. Thankfully, Nina is a sci-fi buff and highly intelligent, and makes a little contraption that should let her go to the festival and still be protected, but Patsy presses the wrong button and crashes right into the building. She freaking snaps at Nina over her hair getting messed up. Quite unfairly too, ignoring how the gesture is still appreciated, and technically her crashing is her fault. I mean, Patsy pushed the button, you know. No, oi! Oi! Talk to me! Break it! Ah! Oh yeah! But it's tough to see. Nina only wanted to help her friend. And upon hearing this, she feels shunned. However, it's much more believable for Nina to want friends than Samson, because, well, people who are into niche, nerdy things typically have harder times finding people on that same wavelength. Not that they can't find friends, or even that they can't make friends that aren't like them, but, you know, you want people to really understand you for who you are. Consider it a gift from Rodney, Steve, Carl, and me. A gift of parting and a gift of friendship. Samson's just a fucking goober. I can't stand him. You guys can't stand him. He, she, me, we all can't stand him. <laughs> Aliens take refuge in their science shack for the day, secluded from the rest of the area, and they think it'll make more sense to wait with Nita until the festival. Nina is overjoyed with real aliens being around her, but the aliens are far less enthusiastic. Either way, despite Nina overindulging into her interest, it's far easier to stick with her as a protagonist because she's inherently more likable. Patsy and Gretchen come to their senses and want to patch things up, but Nina wants to stay with the aliens. 
I think this is important because it paints both of them in a better light than Samson, who didn't even apologize after he found out he was kinda right to be suspicious. It's realistic too in a way. Friends argue and can't always mend things simply, but making that first step to try to fix things shows character. It's much better afterwards. I especially like when Patsy and Gresham find other impossible science fiction anomalies for her to fawn over, and Nina simply does not care. Nina being super oblivious to these aliens and how they obviously are not here to be friends is funny too. That goes without saying. But I guess my issue with this episode is that it just ends. Nina, Patsy, and Gretchen make up thanks to this elaborate plan by Gretchen to trigger Patsy's allergies by stuffing her face with cheese. The disguise that Patsy and Gretchen make fails eventually and everyone finds out that there's no cheese, so the aliens express their frustration, ditch their disguises that Nina gave them, and go back to their spaceship. Everyone screams in terror and that's that. I'm kind of feeling cheated because everything else, while not fantastic by any means, was a complete 180 in terms of the well, stinker that was the first episode. Overall, there are definitely multiple good aspects to both these episodes, especially cheese orbs, but I wouldn't go out of my way to watch these. I can't say whether or not the show's quality as a whole is representative of this, but it is what it is, as we say around these parts. Maybe one day I'll look back on the show as a whole, but I'm definitely gonna hold it off for now. Now, I'm freaking tired, and I just want to do what I do best. Listen to some ska, baby! Yeah, it's obvious if you've seen my Blam video, but hey, I love this music. And all this alien talk may want to blast this. It's a bop. Plus, I mean, <laughs> female aliens are real cute. Put me in Steven's place when he met all those gross corpses if you catch my drift. <laughs> hey, don't look at me like that. Man can dream. Wait a minute. Wh what's that light? I wasn't expecting dreams to come true that fast. Hey, 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 I wasn't expecting this either. Get this thing off of me. Huh? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of doing these. D'Angelo's part's next. What you got there, intern? Look, looks like we got some mail. I, I, I didn't know we got mail. Does, does that mean there's an exit? Are you still on about that? What part of endless servitude don't you get? Just read the letter. Hello, D'Angelo. My name is Kel. I am the head of PR at the international brand Baited. Thank you for accepting our sponsorship offer. We're working on a new project called Invaded. This package we are sending you includes your segment to review, which will be Billy and Mandy. Your review should be comedic and showcase clips from the segment. We will also be sending a package to the five other collaborators your video will be put together with. Can't wait to see your product, Kel. You know, your voices have gotten a lot better. Yeah, well, I've had time to practice. So much time. A sponsorship, huh? Normally, I'd just trace this back and destroy who would ever try to give me orders, but I'm in the mood for something fun. All right, let's do it. Also, does it look different in here to you? Nope. All right, hello everyone and welcome to Hats Off. I'm your host and recently sponsored entrepreneur, D'Angelo Edwards. Today, thanks to our gracious benefactor, we are going to be looking at something that covers two of my favorite things, Billy and Mandy, and corporately forced crossover events. When opportunity knocks, you don't want to be driving to the maternity hospital or sitting in some phony baloney church or synagogue. Seeing Invaded was one of the last big events that took Cartoon Network by storm. Back in the 2000s, where networks tried to be something more than just ads for their app, Cartoon Network launched an event where five different shows would come together in a miniseries, with the main link being an alien invading the different shows. Events like this are really what pushed the network into the number one spot for me. Especially this one, since it was so creepy and moody. 
Plus, who doesn't love a good abduction? This guy knows what I'm talking about. But today, I'm going to be looking at the finale of the Invaded series, ending with a Billy and Mandy special. Billy and Mandy, Moon the Moon. It starts off pretty normal, Billy picking his nose, Harold just living that life. But after being forced to go to bed, Billy sees a mysterious light and follows it to adventure. But only ends up finding Spurg, the local bully, punching corn, which is probably an innuendo, but it's over my head. They actually do end up getting abducted, you know, because of theming. And we get our first look at the aliens, which are the same ones that invaded the other shows. And boy do they use CGI. It's a little jarring and I don't really know why they used it either. The aliens aren't really that complex and neither are the flying saucers, but maybe it was to give them an otherworldly feeling, I don't know. There's nothing worse than using CGI when it's clearly not in your budget. Whoa! Sorry folks, I've been uh, trying to find more talent for the show and this guy seemed like a good fit, but I don't know. Text 8008 the hats off if you want him to stay. But Billy and Spurg end up escaping and going back home, only to find that every dairy product has gone missing. And after watching Harold rearrange the inside of Gladys' mouth for some reason, Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I just realized I've been saying character names and relationships without really explaining the show. The aliens start the invasion showing off their ability to shoot cheese out of their armpits. Neat. The gang end up getting taken to the mothership, and we learn that the aliens require cheese to power their weapons. Or their ships. I don't know, something like that. And that they are periodically building and rebuilding the moon in order to change into werewolves to take over planets to steal cheese, to start the whole process over again. Look, this is Billy and Mandy, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but when does it ever? Though I do wish the aliens had a better motive, like, I'd be fine if they just like destroying stuff. But it's whatever. Billy wants to fight against the aliens by once again donning the helm of the Green Sweaker, with the others taking on similarly dairy-themed personas. But this being a Billy idea, it is promptly ignored. And to be honest, I see why they would ignore it. There's only one person I can see this plan working on. Think you're gonna have a hard time teaching me anything with this ice cream all over your head, super dude! <laughs> super dude. Instead, the crew is tossed into a gladiator pit and forced to fight one another, with special care taken to avoid Spurg, since the aliens kind of put a bomb in his head. Yo, every time I say his name, I feel like I'm one step away from this video getting taken down. Meanwhile, on Earth, the lack of cheese has led to a large rat protest and even calcium deficiency. Who needs calcium, yo? Oh, bummer. It kind of makes me miss Envil, because the side characters are half the fun of Billy and Mandy. And up on the moon, things aren't any better. With the aliens starting to change into werewolves, Billy getting infected, and Grim and Mandy about to be eaten. But at the very last minute, Grim actually uses his vast magical powers. Because why wouldn't he? The gang is transformed into the dairy-based crime fighters and fight against the werewolves. While Spurg decides to make the ultimate sacrifice. Using the bomb in his head to blow up the mothership. And then the plot just kind of ends. Not the episode, just kind of the story. Mandy and Grimm keep fighting crime, Spurg just doesn't have a head anymore, and the narrator of the episode, Sir Raven, yells because he'll never score, poor guy. Now this is where it gets tricky because unknown to me at the time, this episode had two alternate endings. The one I saw had the aliens decide to rebuild the moon with their armpit cheese. Ending with the KND moon base getting covered in cheese. Which is interesting because how do they keep building and breaking down the moon without the KND knowing about it? Continuity errors? Not in my shows, thank you. But the other ending actually ties into the entire Invaded event. With us seeing that some of the other characters from the other shows were abducted and had their brains sucked out. Two pretty obvious results. So how does this special hold up? Well, it's alright. It's pretty good. It's definitely not bad, but it kind of lacks the punch of a usual Billy and Mandy. And definitely lacks the punch of a usual Billy and Mandy special. 
The characters feel kind of subdued. Billy isn't as crazy, Grimm feels a bit more complacent, and if this was normal Mandy, she would have had the situation wrapped up in 11 minutes or less. The CGI also has not aged well as I mentioned before, and I don't think it would have been any harder if they had just done it traditionally. At least there's shading, which is more than you can say for a few other specials. But for what we got, it wasn't too bad, though I prefer Billy and Mandy vs the Martians. Even if Maxwell Adams would disagree with me on that. While none of the creators of the shows in the Invade event were too plussed about doing it, Maxwell decided to make the best of it and take another crack at sci-fi, and he was happy enough with the product. He even boarded it himself. And like I said, I don't hate it. It was fun enough seeing them tie into the other episodes, like Dr. Brainiac getting a sweater from Frankie, and the cutouts of all the different CN characters. Though it does beg the question of how Frankie knew Dr. Brainiac would come to life. I'm watching you, Frankie. And not just in those other episodes you're in. But as a conclusion to such an epic event in Cartoon Network history, you could have done a lot worse. And with that, my contract is complete. Just gotta upload this baby and I can collect some easy money. Ooh, maybe I can get my intern a new pair of handcuffs. He's really earned it. Good thing I won't have to share the money with anyone, though. <laughs> All for me. Oh, joy. And I think people thought my vocal delivery was flat before. Uh. Oh, yeah, what happened to that sponsorship? When am I getting paid? I'm the smallest channel here, therefore, I deserve the most cash. Cash is in my name. Yo, where was my invaded package? Niggas really think I'm too Hollywood because I screamed into a mic about Steven Universe for four years. Ugh, my head. Yo, you good? I saw your last video and you were freaking out so much that your mouth opened. I thought you were having a stroke or something. I probably was. Brain felt like I was getting jazzed on. What the fuck hacked my brain? Where the fuck are we? Why the fuck are we puppets? And why the fuck can't I say fuck? That's my bad, actually. I allow killing, kidnapping, and general debauchery, but no swearing. Also, hi guys! Whoa, where the heck am I? Last thing I remembered is getting ready to start an all-day Zeke and Luther marathon. There's a f***ing duck in here. Good to see you too. Wait, why am I a sock puppet? Seriously? This is what we're doing? That's messed up. This is really a f***ing sock puppet. Wait! I can't say nigga either? What type of backward ship are you running, D'Angelo? You know, you always seem more composed than this. I guess you shouldn't meet your heroes. Or you should meet me when I haven't had my brain sexed up and then turned into a dollar store muppet. A little hurtful, but okay. <laughs> yeah, man, without microaggressions, no need to get racist. Seriously, D'Angelo, what's going on? Did you get tired of torturing your intern and decide to bring us into your weird fetishes? Okay, so I know this seems like a me thing to do? But I didn't do this. Oh really? Then who exactly did? I don't know, but it just smells like Canada. Oh god, they're gonna come after me for making fun of Total Drama Rama. Wait, how does shit smell like Canada? Canada doesn't even exist outside of Scott Pilgrim. Don't you dare say his name! Yo, this shit Cash is like talking a lot. Anybody else notice this? I know it's your first collab, but yeah, you know, relax, bro. We gonna do this again. Okay, you guys are coming up in my house and trying to start stuff. You know I'm me, right? You guys are here. I have the advantage. Bruh, you call us a house? Where is the roof? We don't do that here. <laughs> well, now my collection's complete. Wait, who is that? I mean, it's not weird to hear Evo laughing around here. We like to have fun. You have problems. You all look so cute and small. You'll fit nicely in the clothing I have for you. I got a real bad feeling about this. I don't. I mean, hey, hey, hey. Look at all these cute clothes. Sorry, I don't have any clothing that you guys would like, but these dresses would look good on you. Oh, 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 hell no. I dare you to come near me with that thing. I dare you. I'm sorry. Who, who wrote this shit? I don't, I don't talk like this. Oh, man. I had a dream just like this. Except this time it's Carrie instead of Keenan Thompson. And none of you guys are wearing Buzz Lightyear costumes. Nuh-uh-uh. You all are invited to my tea party. 
<laughs> That's why I kidnapped you. Oh, do you know how lonely it is out here in space? You all are my friends. Forever. <laughs> well, I'm a Muppet. I'm about to be put in a dress. I'm stuck in space. And I'm an alien's freaking toy. What now? Hey, hey, everyone, just get out of my house. I just want to leave. I just want to live my house. I just want to live my house. And then they learned to live their lives as puppets until they were rescued by... Oh, let's say... Nintendo. Episode is wild. <laughs> like, yeah, there's a lot going on. <laughs>